Hi, I'm Joel Richardson, and this is The Underground. Welcome to this week's episode of The Underground, a program that explores the testimony of the biblical prophets, the gospel of Jesus Christ, current events, and how all of these things relate to you and me. Now, in this week's episode, I want to jump right in and talk about the Turkish referendum. What in the world is going on in Turkey? How does this affect the Middle East? What comes next? And could Recep Tayyip Erdogan be the Antichrist? Now, first of all, let me just say this before I jump into this topic. Um, Discussing whether or not someone is or could be the Antichrist, this is actually a topic that consistently over the past dozen or so years I have always tried to avoid. And the reason that I've tried to avoid it is because I think it's incredibly dangerous, and I think it's one of the most common mistakes and errors, in fact, that many teachers of prophecy, students of prophecy actually make. Um, Really, if you go through and you look at the history of premillennial biblical interpretation, i.e. those who believe in biblical prophecy, that it's yet future, a futurist premillennial orientation, um, you really have a few common errors and mistakes that are repeatedly made over and over and over again. Um, I've discussed some of them in the past, but one of them is calculations, is going into various passages in the book of Daniel and trying to calculate or figure out based on the 2,300 days or the 1,260, 1,290, et cetera, et cetera, 1,335, looking at these days and then, oh, wait a minute, maybe they mean years, this, that. And using these various calculations, it might not be in Daniel, it might be someplace else, but basically trying to use these calculations to establish the return of Jesus or this, that, or the other thing. Oftentimes, it's based on the reestablishment of the state of Israel. And those things, I'm not saying they're, uh, we should never do them. I'm just saying that most often when premillennial futurists make mistakes, oftentimes calculations has been one of the biggest stumbling blocks, one of the biggest snares, one of the biggest traps that we've fallen into, and as a result, have made tremendous, innumerable false predictions. Various teachers stake their whole lives on some particular calculation. We won't get into the history of that. I mean, we could go through so many. Um, The other one is mixing extra-biblical revelation with biblical prophecy, usually as the launching pad and then trying to make the scriptures align with some particular view. We've seen this a handful of times, even just over the past recent years, uh, zeroing in, focusing maybe on um, the the Mayan calendar or maybe the prophecy of St. Malachi or, you know, one of these sort of extra biblical revelations and making that primary and then trying to use scripture to substantiate some extra biblical revelation. Um, another issue is, um, which ties into sort of the previous, it's, it's sort of a combination of the two, which is various planetary uh, cosmological signs and this sort of thing. And again, I'm not saying that that's completely, um, that we should never ever do it. I'm just saying that we often make mistakes when we try to go down that path. Um, And then I'll just stop it here, but say the third really um, big issue that people make is antichrist pointing, the big mistake that we fall into, antichrist pointing. Once someone is convinced that some particular individual is the antichrist and they go, could this guy be the antichrist? And they zero in on some various dictator or politician or leader, um, their entire eschatological framework ends up being, and and their way that they interpret every world event becomes revolve, it, it becomes wrapped around the idea that some particular individual is the antichrist. I've seen this We've seen this numerous, numerous, numerous times. I can't tell you how many times for the past eight plus years, people were absolutely angry at me because I would not say that President Barack Obama is the Antichrist because they knew that he must be. And I would say, I don't think that lines up with the biblical criteria for the Antichrist at all. 
It's not to say that he didn't have anti-Christic qualities and things and legislation and different things that he uh, passed that was very anti-Christic, but I don't believe that he meets the biblical criteria to be the Antichrist. So, all of this said, for this reason, I have always avoided speculation regarding Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Now, for those who have been following my ministry for any number of years, really over 12 years now, I have been focused on Recep Tayyip Erdogan. I believe that he is a very prophetic character. I believe that he has a very important role to play in the last days. Now, uh, again, this goes all the way back to 2003, 2004, when it, when I first started blogging, probably 2004, 2005, I was focusing and tracking Recep Tayyip Erdogan as he emerged in Turkey. Now, um, I'm going to put up a couple quotes, statements that I made, that I wrote in my book, Islamic Antichrist, again, all the way back in 2004. And you can look at those and see that all the way back in 2004, I was saying, look, there may not be any pressing reason to see Turkey as the leader of an emerging or imminent uh, Middle Eastern empire, of an Islamist empire, but nevertheless, that is what the prophet Ezekiel stated in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Um, I've been clearly pointing to Turkey and the rise of Turkey in a nationalist Islamist manner. Uh, Likewise, I said, that it's, it's very easy for us to often read our enemies into the scriptures. This is another very common thing that people do. Um, they look at the present political or theological uh, enemy of the day, and then they read them into the scriptures. This is simply reading our own circumstances, worldview, our own uh, world into the Bible, and not seeing ourselves as... Um, sort of outside of this story or seeing ourselves within the story, but trying to read our current situation into the scriptures, very dangerous. So in the midst of all this, um, while it's easy to do that, instead what we should do is allow the scriptures to speak for themselves. And if the scriptures say that Turkey would emerge as the leader of the Middle Eastern Empire, then that was what was going to happen. And so for that reason, I've been saying, watch Turkey, watch Turkey, watch Turkey. Now there's much more to it than that. And I'd encourage you, by the way, um, if you have not gotten it yet, please do get. This is a th- roughly five-hour teaching DVD. It's called The Antichrist, Turkey, and the Coming Caliphate. This is packed full of information regarding Ezekiel 38, 39, the Battle of Gog, Magog. Um, I deal with a lot of the history of Turkey, again, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the AKP party, the Islamist party that has completely taken over the nation now, the failed Turkish coup, Uh, So many other things. I deal with it in this DVD. The other DVD that I want to encourage you to get, again, on the store, uh, the Joel's Trumpet store, is What Comes Next in the Middle East. And this is where I deal with a few different things. I deal with Isaiah 19, what's going on in Egypt, but also Daniel 8. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit. I believe Daniel 8 may very well hold uh, the key to understanding what comes next in the Middle East. In terms of major wars, the next major war, Daniel 8, is a profound prophecy that we need to be paying attention to and discussing. And so with that said, I also want to make you aware of a new book that I'll be carrying in the store, Joel's Trumpet store. And some of you have already read it, but if you haven't, I want to encourage you to get the book and read it. It's called Daniel Revisited by Mark Davidson. Now, before I I tell you to plunge in and jump in and um, just embrace everything in the book, let me just say this. I'm friends with Mark, and I've tracked with him, um, in fact, years ago, probably back 2005, 2006, um, Mark used to comment on my blog when I was just blogging, you know, a little bit online, and he was a very articulate writer who was making these excellent maps and a very thoughtful individual. And I always used to ask him, Mark, when are you going to write your book? When are you going to write your book? Um, Because I believe that he really had something to say. And um, so this book, Daniel Revisited, as I said, you can get it in the uh, Joel's Trumpet store. Um, I don't agree with everything that Mark teaches, his his whole framework. Um, That's neither here nor there. Um, It doesn't matter what I believe. It doesn't matter what Mark believes. What matters is that we as teachers encourage you to be Bereans, encourage you to study, to show yourselves workmen approved. Dig into the scriptures. Um, 
Mark essentially holds that the four horsemen of the apocalypse are um, that the, these issues that they unfold prior to the seven year, the final seven years before the return of Jesus, that, that we are in the process of those unfolding right now. And he ties those into um, these various events unfolding that he calls the four signposts in Daniel 8. I don't agree with him with regard to the four horsemen of the apocalypse. I don't agree with him on some of the, the specifics, but as I said, it doesn't matter. I think that Mark has tapped into something with regard to Daniel 8. Um, he also ties in Daniel 7. I don't necessarily agree with him on that. Um, you know, I'm a little bit more open on Daniel 7, but the point is this. You all are called to be prayerful Bereans and to peer into these things, chew on them uh, yourselves as, as responsible students yourselves. So I do want to encourage you to get this. Now, another very easy-to-read book, which Mark has... Um, recently just released as a follow-up to Daniel Revisited, is called Iran's Great Invasion. It's an easy-to-read little uh, fictional book, which sort of, it's a novel, which lays out um, his teaching in very simplified form so you can understand what he believes is to be the next major event in the Middle East. Now, the issue, could Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the new dictator of Turkey, the new uh, I mean, the first the first leader in Turkey to emerge since Mustafa Kemal Ataturk back in the early uh, 20th century, early 1900s, the most powerful leader in Turkey, one of the most strategic, important nations in biblical prophecy. And just in geopolitical terms, it is a profound nation. Could he be the Antichrist? Here's why I don't believe he's the Antichrist. Um, I, I want to lay it out and sort of explain why I don't think he's the Antichrist. Now, is it possible that he could be? It's possible. I don't think he is. And the reason is because I think that the idea that Mark Davidson lays out, again, in Daniel Revisited and Iran's Great Invasion, the idea that Daniel 8, uh, one of the most important prophecies in the Old Testament, I believe it's one of the most important prophecies, it's most often interpreted by most commentators who are futurist commentators, it's interpreted as being primarily a historical prophecy with some end-time implications. So this is the uh, vision, by the way. If you look at the cover of this book, what do you see? You see a two-horned ram and then a singular horned goat, a, a unicorn goat. And that's what Daniel 8 is talking about. It talks about a two-horned ram which comes from the area of Elam, which is southwest modern-day Iran, and it talks about the Medes and the Persians budding out from the region of modern-day Iran going northwest and south or west, north, and south, and, and having a great military victory. Now, saying that that was the Medes and the Persians in history, that's what most commentators say. Well, then after that in Daniel 8, you have this single-horned uh, goat, which comes from the west, Right now, it later says that it's coming from the area of Yavon. Most translations will say that that's Greece. What is the problem with the translation of Greece? The problem is, is that the book of Daniel was written approximately roughly 500 plus years um, prior to Jesus's birth. Well, back in that time, there was no Greece. Greece didn't exist. The word there in Hebrew is Yavon, and it pointed to a region which is essentially Western Asia Minor or modern-day Turkey. So now this, this goat with a prominent horn, the unicorn goat, comes from the region of modern-day Turkey. Later, the term Yavon biblically came to refer to a much broader area than just Western Turkey, and it was often used to refer to Greece. Okay, but we have to realize that at the time that the book of Daniel was written, um, there was no Greece yet, so we should stick with the biblical term rather than inferring what may or may not, it may not have been intended to infer. So, but the reason, again, this is part of it, is the reason it's often translated as Greece is because commentators infer, insist that the prophecy is fulfilled historically. So the events of the Medo-Persians moving westward and invading, they reached all the way up into Europe, followed by the Alexandria, Alexandrian Greek response. Alexander the Great, the Greek king, as he then burst forth toward the east and conquered the Medo-Persian Empire. 
Now, we know those events in history, and I do believe that Daniel 8 was um, was shadowing, that those events were a foreshadow of the fulfillment of Daniel 8. But, and I've pointed this out various times, when you look at the words of the angel Gabriel, as he then comes and interprets the prophecy for Daniel, he says three times, Daniel, this vision that you've just seen, about the ram and the goat, and then the four horns that come up out of the goat, and this sort of thing. He goes, Daniel, this vision concerns the time of the end. Daniel falls asleep. Gabriel touches him, picks him up, and he goes, son of man, listen, understand that this concerns the final period of indignation. He states three times, very clearly, that the prophecy concerns the end times. Yet virtually all commentators say it's historically fulfilled. And then some futurists say, but when you get to the portion of the prophecy which deals with a little horn, a little horn, they go, well, that could have been inferring or pointing to Antiochus Epiphanes. Again, a figure um, who was active in the intertestamental period, uh, wrecked havoc in Israel, killed roughly 40,000 Jerusalemites carried off another into exile and captivity, another 40,000 into slavery. He made Judaism illegal. He, his, his exploits are discussed. His abominations are discussed in the extra canonical books of Maccabees. You can read all about that. It's well-documented history. And so what some people will say is that the events and the things and the actions that were carried out by Antiochus, that those are a shadow or a type of that which will be carried out by Antichrist. And in that sense, the prophecy is an end-time prophecy, okay? That's how they justify the words of the angel Gabriel, who says this prophecy is an end-time prophecy. Now, what Mark is arguing and what I have also argued is that Daniel 8 is, should be understood in a completely futurist manner, a consistent futurist manner, which is to say that we will see an Iranian invasion of the Middle East followed by a Turkish military response, after which time the prominent singular horn on the goat is broken off. Wait a minute, that's Alexander the Great. That's what all the commentators say. If the prophecy is to be taken, if the words of Gabriel are to be taken at face value, if the prophecy is to be understood in a consistently futurist manner, then that would mean that this prominent horn, which the prophecy calls, which Gabriel calls the first king of Yavon, then that would mean that he is a future individual. And then what happens is after this, this Turkish response, the prominent horn is broken off. In other words, he dies. He is removed. And then in his place come four new horns, out of which one of these four kingdoms, if you will, comes a little horn. Okay, so what that would mean is that possibly, again, possibly, that Recep Tayyip Erdogan, it's possible that he could be, in fact, the first king of Turkey what the prophecy calls the first king. It's possible that he could fulfill that role, that prophetic role. And in fact, I think there's a very strong chance. I would lean much more strongly toward Erdogan being the first king of Yavon who will be broken off after first an Iranian invasion of the Middle East. Listen, I, I was in northern Iraq um, the beginning of 2015. This is a little over two years ago. And I sat down and I walked through Daniel 8 and laid it out. And this is actually in this DVD, What Comes Next. Um, and I said, look, we're, I, if this prophecy is to be understood in a consistent futurist interpretation manner, then we will see an, an Iranian invasion of, of Iraq and Syria, um, of the Middle East. I don't believe necessarily that they would go so far as to go into Turkey. I could be wrong. But the point is, over the past couple of years... This has all begun to unfold. Iran has not engaged in a full-blown military excursion, but they have well over 40,000 troops in Syria, Iranian-trained troops and militia in Iraq. Iran has basically already invaded the Middle East via proxy. Now, I think the prophecy seems to be pointing to something a bit more aggressive, a bit, a bit more full-scale. But it's already unfolding, friends. It's already unfolding right in front of us. So... 
Iran invades the Middle East. Again, probably something that uh, would be a, bu- a bit more full scale, followed by a Turkish response, after which time the prominent king, the first king of Yavan, is broken off. Could that be Recep Tayyip Erdogan? Between him being the Antichrist or the first king, I lean toward the interpretation of him being the first king, which then means what? That in his place come four, which means that this sort of new Ottoman, this new empire after Turkey expands and conquers uh, Persia, which is what it says will happen, out of one of these new, it breaks up into four, and out of one of these four comes someone who is called the Little Horn. Now, here's the second reason why I don't believe that Erdogan is the Antichrist, because in Daniel 7 and Daniel 8, the Antichrist is referred to as the Little Horn. So he starts small. It says he starts small and he grows up until he is so powerful that it, it actually he becomes filled with the, the, the satanic empowerment. And the prophecy in Daniel 8 actually sort of blurs, it bleeds from talking about this antichrist individual, uh, this antichristic individual, this little horn, and it actually bleeds right into talking about what the devil himself will do in sweeping a third of the stars of heaven out of, out of heaven. So it's talking about the, the casting out of the fallen ones in the last days. We won't get into all of that. But the Antichrist that emerges is a little horn. So could it be said of Recep Tayyip Erdogan that he starts small? And the truth is... He's always been bigger than life. He, he really hasn't started small. But beyond that, in Daniel 11, so not just Daniel 7 and 8, but also in Daniel 11, it refers to the Antichrist as being successful with the help or with a small people. So you sort of have the same theme, the same motif repeated multiple times that the Antichrist starts small. He starts as a person of no account. And this seems to be further on in his career. So this is another reason why I really doubt that Erdogan could be the Antichrist, because as I said, he's always been a larger-than-life character. A third reason is that you have multiple references to the Antichrist starting with a level of trust, starting with a level of a degree, a measure of political capital, whereby he will be trusted. It says that he will conquer through peace, that he will deceive, that he gives away land, that he's a, he's a schemer. From the beginning, he's scheming. He comes initially pretending to be a man of peace, a peacemaker, etc., etc. And it says that the leaders of Israel will actually engage in, he'll eventually have enough political capital that they'll engage in some kind of a covenant, or he'll, he will have the ability to strengthen a covenant with the many, with the leaders of Israel. So, for this reason... For because of Daniel 8, my that I lean toward it being a consistent futurist interpretation that the Antichrist will start as a little horn and that he will seem to be a schemer, a false deceiver, a man initially as a man of peace who eventually shows his true face. None of these things seem to fit Erdogan. Erdogan, in terms of the way that he has schemed and plotted, and believe me, he has been a great schemer, and but also his arrogance, his boastfulness, his his cockiness, that seems to me to describe the Antichrist perfectly when I look at the Antichrist in the latter period of his career. I think Erdogan is a great prototype. Now, could I be wrong? Could Erdogan be the Antichrist? So now I've just argued for him not to be the Antichrist. Now let me present the arguments in terms of why he could be. Is it possible that Daniel 8 could be interpreted to where it's dealing with events of history that then bleed into the last days. And when Gabriel the angel said, Daniel, the vision concerns the last days, that that's all he meant. Is it possible? Yes, it's possible. That's not beyond the scope of what is possible within interpreting this text, because we have this pattern in other prophecies as well. And it's just, it's one of my guiding principles, friends, and and I pray that you all take this principle as, as something to stand by as well. If there's one arena of theology, if there's one issue, if there's one matter that we need to remain humble, cautious, and careful with regard to, it's the issue of the end times, eschatology, particularly speculative, futurist eschatology in terms of the details of how things are going to unfold. We need to be humble. 
We need to be aware of the various options, and we need to be open to the idea that we could easily be wrong. Because a lot of prophecy teachers out there, they get caught on their specific scenarios. Again, they get caught on this guy's the Antichrist or that one. And pride is blindness. Once, and I'm not saying that if you have your theories, you're proud, but if you become overly confident and determined, and even there are folks who they want events to come to pass because they want to be called a prophet or be seen as a prophet. I I see this. I call it the prophet syndrome. You start teaching on prophecy. People start relating to you as if you are a prophet, and there is that demonic temptation to actually give yourself to that. It's demonic. It's dangerous. We, as prophecy teachers, cannot do it. We cannot do it. We have to be humble. Therefore, I think that we have to allow for the idea that Daniel 8 will be interp- should be, could be interpreted as primarily historically fulfilled, but bleeding into the last days, in which case, Regip Tayyip Erdogan could be um, a leader who emerges from one of the four areas that after Alexander died, his various successors took over. Now, again, there's some problems with that that we don't have time to unpack, but it could be that we're simply looking for someone to emerge out of the area of Turkey or the Syria or, you know, one of these regions that Alexander used to control, probably the Seleucid or Seleucid dynasty. This was where Antiochus Epiphanes came out of which could include all of Turkey and much of uh, Syria, really, that whole sort of northern sweat uh, stretch of the Middle East. So it's possible that Erdogan could emerge as the Antichrist. It's possible. I lean toward him being the prophetic individual spoken of in Daniel 8 that's referred to as the little, the um, I'm sorry, the prominent horn on the goat that is then broken off, and it's referred to as the first king of Yavon. I, I think there's a possibility that that's who it could be spoken of now because for years I looked at, I go, well, how could he be called the first King? I mean, he's just one more president in a long line until the Turkish referendum passed. He was giving sweeping powers to essentially be the undisputed dictator. Now you have a lot of commentators out there, by the way, who go, yeah, but you don't, you can't call him a dictator. He's not a standard dictator because he was put in there by democracy Yes, he used the veneer, the facade of democracy. But none of these these apologists for Turkey will uh, quote in the midst of this discussion, because it's a very relevant quote, the quote that Erdogan made early on when he first came into political power back in 2002. Uh, actually, this was prior to 2002. And he said, democracy is like a streetcar. You get on it until you get to where you need to get, and then you get off. In other words, you use the facade of democracy to get to where you need to get. He has done exactly that. He has played by the playbook. There are so many reasons why we could say that this referendum was not a legitimate election. It was not a legitimate democratic process. Recep Tayyip Erdogan is the new undisputed dictator of Turkey. I think that's fair to say he could be considered the first king of Yavon. But of course, time will tell. I mean, we are called to be humble. We are called to be Bereans. We are called to be prayerful. We are called to be watchers, which means that we're paying attention. We're watching events unfold in the earth. We're weighing the various options within Scripture. We are praying. We are watching because these are indeed prophetic times, and these could be the signs that were spoken of by Daniel. They could be unfolding right in our midst. But again, time will tell. God knows best. You know, every one, every one of us is going to get stuff wrong because the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Amen. So listen, friends, um, that is all the time that we have for this week. I just wanted to touch on very briefly some of these profound events that are unfolding in the Middle East. Uh, these are going to have dramatic ramifications for all of us in the days ahead. So we'll come back. We'll continue to discuss this uh, in the weeks ahead. Listen, um, I just want to thank those of you who, uh, you know who you are, those who are regular supporters, both in prayer and finances. It really means the world to me. We've uh, we've just formed, finally, Joel Richardson Ministries. So if you're not a regular supporter, please do consider becoming a monthly partner. Uh, every little monthly donation uh, makes a world of difference. So um, go to joelstrumpet.com, click on Partner, and you can do the automated process. There's a few different ways you can send in a check. Uh, we've got some different options, but again, 
Um, you'll get the tax deduction at the end of the year. As I said, this it, it genuinely means the world to me. Um, I'm staying extremely busy. We have much, much work to do in many different uh, arenas, and we can't do it without you. So really, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, but as always, friends, uh, just thank you for joining us. I do. I look forward to seeing you next week. Until then, I'm Joel Richardson, and this is The Underground. Thank you.